just honor God, what he's doing in the lives of, of so many. And uh, just, just mention that, that God can take you anywhere. And because of God, you know, he wants to interject himself, step on the scene in so many different areas. And I uh, honor Jason and Dan who have been to Foreign Field and, and uh, Dan to Sri Lanka and, and Jason just recently to PNG with a group of three and, and seeing God move and people hear God, um, you know, in the area of healing and salvation and even writing songs, Jason, you know, using the anointing that's on his life and people hearing prophetically God's voice, even to write and express worship songs. And, um, you know, God's heart is expressed in in the way he's he's made us your skills your hobbies your desires your likes and god's not a religious god he's a god of life and uh, he, he he loves laughter and he loves joy and we should have a smile doing it and i have a lot of fun with the prophetic and set people up all the time and my questions asking them questions that I know that they'll respond a certain way, ask me a question, and I can share what I'm about or what's going on. And uh, sometimes my answer is, what do you do? Sometimes it's dream interpreter, sometimes it's, um, you know, uh, pastor, sometimes it's I'm a dad, sometimes, you know. And, and God just expressing his life through your life, can I say. And so it's, we're not trying to develop to a prototype of what a prophet looks like. You know, it's it's not we're not going to wear camel hair and call ourselves John. You know, it's 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 not it's not who it is. And so the modern the modern uh, look of a past of a pastor or a prophet or an evangelist or an apostle is what you look like, and it's Christ's life being developed in you, expressed through you. And so he's gonna you know God loves diversity. He loves diversity, and uh, he's a creator, and he's creating something beautiful in all of us, which is Christ. The image being conformed into the image of Christ. And, um, and so uh, there's a price in that. You know, everyone wants seven ways to stay young and seven ways to be you and 14 ways to be a better you, and God's saying die to you. I want to create something new. Your new creation. And uh, and so, you know, I like what Jason's doing. Jason's got a band called, um, you know, Jason Daniels Band. He's going to be on the radio tomorrow morning up our way. 91.9 on your dial. So, um, and, you know, goes until 740 in the morning. Turn your, turn your t radios on. Anyway, and... Uh, you know, he reminds me of a, of a good friend of mine who travels the United States and does positive kind of role model stuff in elementary schools and high schools across the country, a guy named Jared Campbell. And when Jared was 16, he was my worship leader of a youth movement that took place. And we saw hundreds and hundreds of kids saved and set free and made disciples of Christ. And Jared was a kid that could just start singing the top 40, but also then go right into spontaneous prophetic song and go right into worship and then come back out and do a you know, cover song. And, and Jason's the same way. And Dan's the same way. Dan's a worship leader as well. And just I see God doing in the new that time that we're in where there's an abandonment to God. And it's not a dour abandonment where everything's serious and we can't laugh and we can't have fun and we can't joke and we can't, you know, that's, that's, that's can I say, a, it's a counter look of the real. Okay, and I want to say that because, you know, we are living in serious days. But some of the way we counteract the seriousness of the day is to laugh with God. And it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. But God doesn't rule humanity by logic. He rules it by his kingdom. The kingdom lifestyle. And so, um, you know, God is love. All right. And God is an amazing God who is able to express his love in so many different ways. Uh, but he says in scripture, those whom I love, I correct. 
I chasten. And there, there is a popular opinion right now and thought in Christianity that if you speak about correction, it can't be God. Scripture itself is contrary to that theory. Because it does not practice real life. Any father or mother who does not correct their children is a fool. And the consequences of that our society reaps. And we're seeing it. And so the discipline of the Lord is based on love. All right? And so, so um, it, it's, he, he wants there to be an understanding that evil separates from him. Sin separates from him. And the p ultimate punishment of that is so horrific, he sent Jesus. And Jesus brings a discipline in our life. He brings a boundary. He brings a border. He brings uh, a, 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 a heavenly lifestyle that can be lived through humanity because he became a man, but yet was no less God. He was totally man and totally God, giving us the example that humanity can live godly lifestyle. So he lives the perfect life, so I take his perfect life into me. And when God sees me, he sees me as complete. That is what the word perfect means, completed. When the Father looks at me and you, he sees Jesus. So I'm acceptable. When my lifestyle, when I choose to live the way of the world or by my flesh, he gives me a wonderful word to say, stop that and come back in line, alignment of the way I want you to live. That's the way the prophetic works. That's, that's exactly why we need, you know, prophets and the prophetic ministry in our circles. Hebrews 12.10, For our earthly father disciplined us for only a short period of time and chastised us as seemed proper and good to them, but he disciplined us for our certain good that we may become sharers in his own holiness. God corrects us so that we live holy. And when we live holy, we're pleasing to him. Favors release, blessings release. Can I say heavenly consequences on earth are released for, for our benefit and the benefit of others? Hebrews 12, 6, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. And so, the ultimate goal of the prophetic that God releases is that people would live their life, ultimately, in relationship with Him. Stay on the path or get on the path. Stay being disciples of Christ or get to become. Come in and become disciples of Christ. That's the message. It all boils down to that. Receive his love. Be conformed. Romans 8.29 The whole goal of God for humanity is to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's the whole goal. No matter what, that's the goal. Doesn't matter if you're a jackhammer operator or brain surgeon, housewife, world traveler, or never traveled outside of Brisbane. It doesn't matter. That's the goal. That's God's intent. And so, in Exodus 33 and 34, we have the most ultimate timing of God to reveal correction. If there's ever a time in Moses and Israel's life, here it is, Exodus 33 and 34, and by man's reasoning or logic, this is the unbelievable timing by man's theory, where he should have invented something or given him direction, or he should have... You know, told them, hey, this is the warning of God. These are the events, and it's not what God did. He shows him himself. He actually allows his spirit to penetrate Moses as he walks by, if you read the original Hebrew. Why? Because God's intent is for you to be changed and have the nature and character of God developed in your life. 
He wants you to know his nature and character more than he wants you to do for him. So it's all about character development in the prophetic. And this is going to be the main theme of God from now until Christ returns. It's not about you doing for God, it's about you being with him and being transformed into his likeness, to his image. You will never be divine. It's a lie. You are not ever going to be little gods like the Mormons teach. But he wants to develop your character, be the character he wants you to have. He wants you to have the fruit of the Spirit. And to have the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to have Holy Ghost in your life. You know, you've got to be those that are walkers in the Spirit of God to have the fruit of walking in the Spirit of God. And so, Jeremiah, an example of where the prophets, there's going to be some prophetic release and in that prophetic release, we're going to see where there's going to be some correction in the days we live. There's going to be more correction released by God. But the way that God wants it released is with empathy or compassion. And the prime example of that is a guy named Jeremiah, which they called what? The weeping prophet. Why? Because he had the, carried the heart of God for people. It wasn't just, here's the words, get over it, you deserve it, bam, slam it, hit you in the head. And there's some examples in modern day of people delivering words like that, but that's not God's heart. You know, and, and there, you know, we, there are words of correction carried by New Testament prophets. And I want to, tonight I'm emphasizing uh, something that's not being emphasized in a lot of ranks. Because I believe there's a balance that God wants to bring. It's not a 50-50. It's not a 50, you know, God's not a 50-50. It's got to be 50 this and 50 that. His balancing scales are way different. Um, but um, the revelation of the character or the nature of God is, is on the heart of God to be released to humanity, that we know Him, know His ways, yes. know, know, the, know the attribute of what... You know, God, who He is in His heart for people, for His creation. And so one of those things, requirements, is to spend time in His counsel. To spend time waiting on the Lord. And so we have Mary and Martha as a picture of the modern church. Women represent churches. Symbolic language. And we have... You know, there's two types of churches sitting at the feet of Jesus. One isn't. One's busy around him doing for, doing the traditional thing, doing what's expected. And then there's that church that hears, hey, this is a precious time. I need to listen and sit at the feet of the master. And there's a lot of people running around doing in the name of God and they're missing God. Because they rely on the spontaneous moment. But there's something that God wants to develop in the heart of humanity, the believing community, where we are plowed by revelation and it only comes by waiting. So there are people that, you know, will go around using scripture to excuse their sin. We'll say things like this, well, David had his Bathsheba, so it worked out okay. Solomon had a lot of concubines. What about the woman caught in adultery? She isn't punished. <coughs> and God's looking for a time where we stop using scripture to excuse away sinful action. God's looking for holiness, and holiness is a godly desire. I'm emphasizing this because you're going to see a church, maybe in your lifetime, that will be without spot or wrinkle. He's talking about the church. He's talking about a collective body. And I'm encouraged 
to see a generation like these young guys and others who I'm meeting with and there's a call to holiness that I haven't seen before and it lets me know possibly a timeline that we're in a season that we're approaching very quickly and unfortunately there's a portion of the church that's fallen in love with soulish prophecy And so the modern prophetic look, the role of the prophet isn't to preach out of popular opinion. Uh, it, it's not the gospel that Dan preached about a couple weeks ago of me, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, selfish desires and ambition can be picked up because you all are good at reading soul. It's called life. Yes. So I watch people read someone's soul, their demeanor, they're picked up on their hurt because I've known hurt, so I can recognize hurt in your life, and then they prophesy about that, or into that. It has nothing to do with Holy Spirit. It has to do with soul reading, which all humanity is good at, because you're all human. You can relate to humanity. Jeremiah is full of warnings in this. You prophesy peace, peace, but I'm not saying that. You prophesy this out of your own soul, but I'm not saying this. There's warnings by the Lord himself. And now we see this guy in, in 1 Kings 22 called Machaiah. Now Machaiah is an interesting read. Read about him in 1 Kings 22. We see that it's during the time of Jehoshaphat, he's a king with Ahab, and they're actually in a time which is very encouraging, looking at it outside, in, there's actually 400 prophets of God in that day that are around Jehoshaphat and Ahab. 400 prophets, you read it, 1 Kings 22. That's encouraging, 400 prophets anywhere of God is encouraging. <laughs> So the, the, the school of prophets is pumping them out. They've all got their degree, their certificate, their golden badge. They're recognized. There they are assembled. They've got a company of prophets. And they're seeking the will of God. And they're asked to seek the will of God about should Jehoshaphat and Ahab engage in battle to retake Ramoth Gilead from Aram. And it says that 400 prophets listened 1 Corinthians 20 uh, sorry 1 Kings 22 22 and 23 they listened to a deceiving spirit 400 prophets of God listened to a deceiving spirit that is not a good day and they told the kings what the kings wanted to hear I submit to you we live in these days only tell me Pastor Dave, Prophet Dave Apostle Dave, Teacher Dave Evangelist Dave what I want to hear and if you tell me what I want to hear I'll stay if you tell me what I want to hear, I'll pay my tithe. I'll follow. But if you tell me something that costs me something, or it's irritating, or frustrating, or not the desire of my heart, then you are deceived. You are off. And so we got one guy against 400. The one guy says the opposite thing. And there's going to be a rebalancing in the day we live. There's a rebalancing. There's a reckoning coming. And, and God's going to call certain ones to bring balance back into the church where he's going to allow those to really prophesy what God's saying. And it isn't going to be in the top 100 popular email website prophecies. Now, Machiah is actually, and initially he succumbs and starts to say what the 400 say, and Jehoshaphat says, stop. 
tell me the truth, what you really are to say. And the prophet says, you are to stay home. You are to rest. Now what's the consequence? Well, he says the words, he angers the popular opinion, he's thrown into prison and given limited food and water for saying the word of the Lord. They go off while he's in prison eating bread and water, and they're totally defeated, and Ahab, who was never supposed to, loses his life in the battle. And so we have an amazing boldness that we see. You know, in Machiah, he's willing, when he's pushed by Jehoshaphat, no, tell me the truth. Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. You tell me, you know, Jehoshaphat... He doesn't listen to Micaiah. It's interesting. He wants to hear the truth, but he doesn't listen to the truth. And we'll find that in these days we're living, there are people that want to hear the truth, but they won't act on the truth. Because there's a cost. There's a price. There's pride. There's stubbornness. There's all sorts of things. I figured it out. I have a preconceived idea. I want this so bad. I want the glory for this. I want to be seen as the one that broke through. So here we have one lone guy hears the word of the Lord against 400 trained prophets of God. We have a guy named Zedekiah who slaps Machiah's face for saying the word of the Lord. Can I say that if you speak the true word of the Lord, you could get slapped for it. <laughs> You could find yourself in friendship prison. <laughs> Ministry prison. I, you know, I have friends that have given the word of the Lord and all of a sudden, all of their itinerary mysteriously gets canceled for the next two months. And then people have to call months later after the two month stint to ask for forgiveness and ask him to come. There is a prophetic ministry coming in the last days. It's not going to be popular by man, but it is by God. Yeah. Now this is an everyday Joe I'm talking about. This is recognized prophets to the body of Christ. And so we're not releasing everyone to go around giving corrective words and say the opposite thing on purpose that everybody else is saying. You know, please understand with maturity what I'm talking about. Ironically and thankfully, Israel did not throw out prophecy from its midst in this debacle. That's to their credit. I've watched a lot of churches where it's messy and things are wrong and messed up and they throw out prophecy altogether out of their ranks. No, we're not going to receive anybody called prophet anymore. We're not going to recognize anybody called prophet anymore. And, 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 and they throw out baby with bathwater because it's messy or it's not done the way they think. Thankfully, Israel didn't do that. And I think there's hope in that. I think there's a church that's not throwing out the prophetic or the prophet because there's been some situations that have been messy in the past. There's a maturity that's coming. Jeremiah, they threw him down a well and disregarded his words, if you read scripture. Elijah is called the troubler of Israel because of his words that were truth. And that's when Jezebel tried to kill him. Why did the 400 miss it? What causes 400 men of God who have passed the school of the prophets test are summoned by the kings to prophesy and they seek the word of God? Why would 400 miss it? You've got to ask that question. And so there's some answers to that. Can I say this? That if you buy a battery and it doesn't work, I bet you, you don't go through life never buying batteries. If you ever buy a car that's a lemon, I bet you, you don't walk the rest of your life 
that you actually take another shot at buying a car. It's the same with prophecy, can I say. Just because you might get one wrong or two wrong or something said to you or you've even missed, you don't throw out prophecy. Mm -hmm. Just like when I pray over someone for healing and they don't get healed, I don't discount healing. Or when I preach the salvation message and not everybody gets saved that's supposed to, I don't say, well, Jesus isn't salvation and this is a whole bunch of wrong message. And so God's looking for a mature response. And so can I say that, that um, you know, sometimes you can fall into the trap of it's about me. Yeah. Can I say that even in ministry, it can become self-centered. Yeah. Right? And I submit to you that maybe the 400 got a little bit self-centered. It's about us. The king asks us for the word. Oh, we must be important. We must get this. Hey, I got some status, you know. Maybe they actually had the ability in their soul to read what the kings wanted to hear. We don't know the whole story, but sometimes you can tell by demeanor, right, or action or words said or inference, and you're like, well, this person wants this prophecy. This must be the word of the Lord. Boom, I want to be on his good side or her good side, or I want favor. I want to be asked to preach again or speak again or do worship again. So here's what I'm going to tell them, what they want to hear. Because you get the nuances of humanity. Jeremiah 23.30 says that the prophets had the ability to steal my words from each other. Well, he said it, and he said it, and he said it, and I know her, she said it, and he said it, and she said it, and I've known her for 10 years. It must be the word of the Lord. I'm going to say it too. Because I want to be seen to be right. But they never sought God individually, but they sought, maybe sought Him corporately, and it became the opinion group. And can I say, we need to search the word of the Lord for ourselves. Yes. Yes. We just don't go because it's on the internet. Which is very popular way of doing things today. The hype of a large crowd can be misconstrued as the anointing. And I've watched large crowds jump up and down in excitement, and there's no anointing, but there's an amazing energy that comes because a bunch of people got together with a focus. But that's not necessarily the anointing. It's just an energy and a buzz and excitement of the moment. And I've watched conferences where people come in all excited and it's hyped, and that's not wrong, but let's not call it the anointing of God. It's the energy off humanity getting focused, ready to worship God, but the anointing hasn't even fallen yet, really. It's an energy. And so, you know, I think that God's going to bring us into a place of awareness that it's not based on hype, it's based on the true anointing who Christ is. The other thing I want to say is that as we move forward, there's got to be less of an emphasis on mystical experiences as a sign that you've heard from God. Yes. Okay? Or a prophetic gifting, because you had some angelic encounter, a translator, a transporter, taking the third ever, whatever. And, you know, I, I, I've just, you know, I've had some amazing enc encounters. Uh, and I don't have any books written. Uh, you can't go to any website. I don't have a website yet. I'm about to start one of prophetic training, hopefully, a prophetic training school online. But uh, what my point is, not to make myself above or elite or anything else like that, but I'm sus on so many having mystical experiences as an authenticity that they're from the Lord or it's, they hear God accurately. And so the focus has to be on intimacy with Jesus, yes. not an outward experience or I had 16 angels come and blow a horn and give me instructions for today. <laughs> Um, he is the living word. He's the living and active word. Hebrews 4.12. And we see that I, I'm a little nervous on some circles that are forcing themselves or positioning themselves or conditioning themselves to have experiences. Mm -hmm. 
to go to the throne room, to go here, to be sent here, send you to heaven. It's all baloney. And um, I say that because Revelation 4 says the doors open and God says, come up here. John doesn't make himself go and see the door and go through the door and astral project with demons and then pretend that it's his spirit translating. Jeremiah has a call of God with no mystical experience. Jeremiah 1.10. And he's a prophet of God. Jeremiah 1.9, God just simply says, I put my words in your mouth. He had no choice. He was called to be a prophet. The other thing is, I can dream interpret. That is true. That is from God. That's the Holy Spirit gifting He has given me. I didn't ask for it. It just was there. And the, the crazy thing is, I've asked the Lord. I can't turn it off. <laughs> it's not every dream I get interpreted accurately or whatever, but I, I know I have the, interpret, the ability to interpret dreams. So I'm, I know who I am. It makes people sometimes uncomfortable because I say it with confidence. But I know who God is to the point I know who he is and how he's made me and what I'm called to. And the Ecclesiastes is very clear saying that. But the other side of that is, it's very clear that says that there's those that have many dreams and many words and, you know, they base their life on. And, and uh, he's saying that it's emptiness, meaning you can't base your life on 17,000 dreams and, you know, 40,000 words. He says, fear the Lord. And one of the things that's going to be restored to our ranks is fear of God is coming back, everybody. Yes. The fear of the Lord is going to be a standard again. Yes. Uh, in the ministry of the prophetic or not, it's the fear of God is going to be an amazing standard mm -hmm. that we're going to need and uh, more and more. Uh, in, in Philip, we see, you know, he, he, Philip never sought the Lord to be teleported. He just is. So he has this weird and awesome experience, but he didn't get on some special mat or, you know, snort some fairy dust or have some pure water from Shiloh or whatever. Uh, it just happened. And there, there is a warning, can I say, in Simon the Sorcerer. There is a, is a stark warning to the Church of Acts. And we are part of the church of Acts. Yes. We want action. We want the acts of the Holy Spirit in our ranks. We better want it. God wants it. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, one who's formally practicing magical arts. Simon of the, the Sorcerer. And uh, he astonishes the Samaritans. He astonishes the people. And he's actually called, he is actually called the great power of God. You read scripture, Acts 8, 8, 9 through 11. Paul intervenes, verse 21. He has supernatural psychic power by demonic force. And he wanted it for what? And I submit to you that God's going to clean house for all those using supernatural for... And there's going to be a cleansing. We're going into it. You're going to see it clean up. It's coming. So, you know, Paul has an amazing third, third heaven experience. He didn't ask for it. And uh, God allows that to happen. Uh, and the Holy Spirit is the baptizer. He baptizes us, hallelujah, even into Christ. He points the way to Jesus and the Father. He indwells within us. And 1 Corinthians 12, you can see it, 12 and 13. And uh, yeah, I mentioned that, I mentioned that, I mentioned that. Can I say that God is good? <laughs> <laughs> and it says, His kindness leads me to repentance. But also God is corrective. And God is priest, and God is judge, and God is king, and God is deliverer, and God is healer, and God is savior. 
and God is indweller, and God is director and revelator. So the balance, I, you know, I see that there's going to be sometimes warning and cautions, and there's going to be great joy and celebration. It's God. It's the whole counsel of God. Can I say it's the whole nature of God? We, we need to embrace God and who He is. It's not one or the other, it's both. And it's not God, the Old Testament God is the God of, you know, cranky and the God New Testament is all happy, you know what I mean? It's, it's a misnomer. But the God is going to uh, bring the prophetic into a character development like never before. Character over giftedness is going to be a huge emphasis. And we're going into that. We're already in that. And uh, King Saul is our example. King Saul lost the fresh anointing of God. He lost the fresh anointing of God because of lack of character. And Saul still prophesied. Don't be duped. I'm going to say it again. Don't be hoodwinked. Don't be sucked in. What does that mean? Just because a man can prophesy or lay hands on and be healed doesn't mean his character is right. And the Antichrist will do amazing miracles. And so it was Saul who lost his fresh anointing And it was Samuel, the one who didn't lose his anointing, that prophesied to Saul and says, you've lost your anointing. You know, you're, you're acting out of horrible character. You have horrible character. Even though the people love you and you're looking like a king out in front, behind in real life, you have horrible character. And you read Matthew 7, but what God talks about that. So the character of God being in us and he's changing us inwardly. And so here's, here's kind of the deal. The spirit of Jezebel wants God to move in the church so she can move. Don't you think about it. The spirit of Jezebel wants a move of God so she can be seen and have glory and take credit. The spirit of Jezebel wants God to move so that she can take credit and be seen and she can move. The spirit of Elijah wants God to move so God can move. And there's a major difference. See, a lot of people think God's around for them. Isn't this awesome? Now I get to be fulfilled. Now I, now I, now I, now I. Look at me. Now I, hey, come follow me. Look at me. Hey, I can do this. Isn't this fun? Now, isn't God amazing? Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God glorious? Look at what God did. Look at what he's doing. Totally different character development. I'm going to say this, a prophetic kind of statement. Freedom does not mean that it's a free for all. Where everything goes and is okay. There's no character in that. So humility and meekness and gentleness and the fruit of the Spirit we're going to see like never before in those who are being character developed by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are going to be blatantly evident in those who are spending Papa time. Can't help but happen.
My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19. It's about the formation of Christ in our life. Well, how do we prophesy? Ask the Holy Spirit. What are activities we can do? Ask the Holy Spirit. Well, how does that look? Ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it says very clearly in John, is your trainer. He's your instructor. We can do all sorts of activation. I do 32 hours, 36 hours. I do hours upon hours with people. And at the end of the day, it has to be the Holy Spirit of instruction. I can do all this stuff about symbolism. And if you don't have Holy Spirit, you won't be able to interpret a dream. Not one. I can give you all the books in the world that I've written or have or whatever and haven't published yet or other people's. And you won't be able to do it because you don't have Holy Spirit operating. He is the interpreter of dreams. Only God can interpret dreams. It's very clear. It's only God who can teach someone how to prophesy. You can get instruction, you can get templates, you can get prototypes, and you can get all sorts of stuff, and all those are helps. But at the end of the day, you have to be you, and Jesus in you, developed in you, and allow him to train you in how it looks for you. I'd much rather, and in more emphasizing now than ever, character development over giftedness. Because if I can help you and train you and and, and al allow you the ability and time to seek Him, all the rest will happen. But character development doesn't just happen. You have to lend yourself to that. You have to be intentional about that. You want to sit at His feet and you want to repent and ask for forgiveness and let God do surgery on your heart and your character and cut things off. You know, that's important. And the giftedness, that'll be trained. But for hundreds of years, we've emphasized giftedness. Yes. And there's been no character. And we have a lot of shipwrecks and a lot of books. So this is what the modern prophetic prophet, the role of the prophet, I think, is where we're going. I think that's where we're at. And for the next 15 minutes, let's take some questions, unpackage, see if the Holy Spirit would expound upon. For those that have questions in the area of prophecy and prophetic and and the the amount of of character hard bit of suffering development of a prophet is without question noticeable as compared to just having the gift of prophecy having the gift of prophecy it is an amazing um, experience and can I say it doesn't cost you nearly as much as sitting in an office of a prophet. So the squeezing of your being is way more intense. The weight and the crushing and the walk and the misunderstanding and the, the, the degree of attack is way more on a prophet than in the gift of prophecy. That's one way. You just don't get recognized as a prophet overnight. You might be called to be a prophet your whole life before you knew you were, but there's a walking it out that's undeniable. And to walk out 
the office of God, there's loneliness involved, there's misunderstanding, there's betrayal, there's things that, that, that develop your reliance upon God and not the approval of man. Yes. Do you think that in the last day of the Lord, well, we are in the last day, that the Lord will rise up, raise up a lot of prophets or just a few prophets with a loud voice? No, I think there's a lot of prophets. And I think um, there's different types of prophets. And I think there's a lot more false prophets. <laughs> There'll be more prophets. Any false prophets and teachers? Yep. Yes? With, um, with churches, it's attempting to try and understand, from my point of view, what's happening in the whole Australian church. And uh -huh. I'm just a little kid and just one little peep out of it. Yep. Different prophets, would they, amongst them, have a, like a sea of understanding? In the state of the church or no. So they just their pockets in their yep. We know in part, we see in part. No one sees it all. And uh, except God. And there's room for discussion and dialogue about what you think God's saying, and it's not necessarily the same thing. You know, there's a generalized plan for Australia to be made followers and lovers and disciples of Christ. But again, that diversity, what God's necessarily doing in Adelaide, he's not doing in Brisbane. You know, or what he's doing in Northern Territory. What he's, you know, one thing in Australia, we be, we're going to be a unified nation, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. First Nations got to be involved in what God's doing. It's not going to be a white man's game. And there's a stir in Aboriginal communities right now like never before. We're seeing it. There's a connection happening. We're seeing it in our ranks and others. There's, God's bringing the unified. And God's had me just sit with the elders of the Aboriginal community of the nation that we, we live in. And we got blessing and we're working together. And there's some amazing things going on right now. So I can tell you that for Australia, it's a unified front. It's not just one people group. I can tell you that uh, Australia is called to be a prophetic voice to the nations because you know the, the enemy is a liar and when you see the counterfeit it tells you the plan of God when you see the plan of God you can see the counterfeit attack so Australia led the new age movement of the world for decades well, the new age is the complete opposite of the prophetic it tells me that this nation is called to be a prophetic nation that's also on the nation so you know prophets would agree on those things but how that's outworked in you know, Warknabeel, Victoria, as opposed to, you know, Perth, WA, can be different. Yeah. And scripture tells me that, because the prophets all are the same. They don't come all from the same social, economic, uh, educational system, you know, they're, and they're counterparts. Not all prophets work together. You know, it, it's, it's a misnomer that every, part of the body of Christ is going to work together and know each other. There's no way, you know. And there's 12 tribes for a reason. Different streams. There's different, you know, the, the liver never touches the pinky. It better not. You know, if you, you, know, you know what I mean? They're part of the same body, but they, they don't have the same function. They don't interact with each other. They better not. You know, there's a problem, you know. And so, you know, it's, it's the same... You know, there's going to be different emphasis, and there's going to be different flavors, and it's, it's beautiful. God's not, you know, it doesn't mean uniformity. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. Uh, and you got Daniel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They're all at the same time. They're, they're prophesying at the same time. Their ministry is all counterparts at the same time. Never in Scripture do they work together. They're under the same captivity. So God has his prophets doing different things, you know. God's got me tracking, you know, in this weird way right now, which I won't expound upon or don't don't care to share. And we had got a meeting with the prophets in house, and you know everybody's this and this, and this is similar, and this is different, and I'm way different, and this and you know it's just the way it is. It's just you know God 
wants people in every sector of life bringing the glory of God into the scenario. So don't think you have to look like your brother in the way he's doing it. It's not uniformity. Not necessarily. It depends on, how, you know, uh, depends to the degree we're going to value, you know, anybody talking, with, a, with or without a title, you know. So um, this is the healthiest church in 30 years of ministry I've been involved in. Um, and uh, one of those reasons is we allow the prophetic and the offices to function in their offices with mess. And um, so I'm seeing the value and experience, and I think the lads are experiencing being under leadership and directional messy kingdom living in 2017, and they can talk for themselves about what they've experienced, but this, this prototype that we're, it's, that we're allowing this organism that's messy a lot with life is definitely helping give us a heads up with strategy and implementation more so than I've ever been involved in the local level. So yeah. how does that affect your church in, say, Sunshine Coast? Do you find it's giving you a greater impact in the community because there's more direction from a more compared to another church that's just doing the same thing? We've grown from about 300 people to 2,000 wow. in eight years. And the impact and the influence is by far and is aided in, in the focus of, you know, um, the, the, the community that would say, the community that would say, hey, we belong to the vision or the house of flame tree um, is, is been aided in allowance of fivefold influence. You know, to strategize, to implement, to delete, to cut off, to stop uh, ministries that we're involved in. And so, you know, we, we function in a very different way. We function with what the giftings or what the calls are in the house, those that know those who labor among you. We don't yes. function as you're supposed to do this. I want you here. No, you didn't write. You're fired. Next one in. Not you're wrong. Fired. You know. And if you leave and you have a ministry, it doesn't mean we're going to replace that ministry because that was your ministry and calling that season. You leave, then it doesn't mean we're going to continue. It's very different. And so it takes a while for people to get used to that functioning, you know. Um, and so, you know, we have that by insight and by the counsel of the Lord. Um, and we have very mature, seasoned ministers in our ranks. You know, with 50, 60 years of ministry experience, that you know, um, and uh, yeah, so it helps. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's not attributed. Why I'm saying is, it's not just attributed to the prophets. It's attributed to fivefold, and it's more so attributed to what God is is speaking through. Even you know, w you know, we have a, a service that's that's open. You know, the way people come up and say they got a word, and we give them the mic, and we just allow it to happen. And then if we have to clean a mess, we'll clean a mess or bring correction. But, <laughs> but it's very rare. But the guys can tell you, there's no other church that does that. I've never, not in the present day. Everyone's scary. Yeah. And, and so it's very freeing. We have people interact us as we preach. We have people shout out and talk and say, <laughs> we interact when we preach. You know, there's 550 people there, whatever, on a Sunday morning. It's a bit bizarre or more. So, um, you know, it's it's allowing the freedom of the spirit and, and journeying, not saying we got all the answers, but God does. So it's not attributed just to one office, if I can say that. You know. But that one office is as important to have involved as all all of them. Any other questions? Good questions. And we don't, we're not perfect. We don't have it all right. There's a lot of things that frustrate me. There's a lot more stuff I'd like to see put in. 
it's a timing thing. There's a lot of things I like to delete. Um, you know, it's a it's it's an ongoing work. It's the same with my life. A lot of things I like to see deleted. Mm -hmm. A lot of things I like to see added. Any other questions? What's the difference between a prophet and a false prophet? Yep. It's not a man or a woman missing details. It's not a false prophet. So it's someone who leads people away from Jesus into themselves or something else other than Jesus. Is that definition found in Deuteronomy 13? Yep. And so, you know, it says many false prophets will come, you know, in the last days. Many false teachers. What makes them false? Well, because they're not talking about the gospel of Christ. Not talking about the kingdom of God. They're not drawing people to or pointing people to Jesus. Okay? And they might be doing signs and wonders. They might be doing miraculous things. They might have power that's demonstrated. If you're going to look at power only and demonstration of power and miraculous as a sign that people are from God, you are going to be easily deceived. That's right. Yep. There was a there was a dispensation where God was silent, wasn't it? And it started again with Samuel. Yeah. Yes. No. No. Samuel was just a man of the word, wasn't he? Yeah. That's right. He wasn't a. It wasn't a sensational lifestyle like Ezekiel or Isaiah. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's and that's where there's got to be if God allowing himself to be revealed, we capture that revealing where we're confident in who God has made us to be and who how he's revealing himself to me and not falling into the trap of comparing how God's dealing with you and saying that's less than or more than your neighbor. Because it's his training in your life. It's how he's made you. What He knows the end game. He knows how he wants to interact you with other people's lives. You know? And you're not going to be the flavor for everybody. I'm not the flavor for everybody. My style's not for everybody. I'm not supposed to be all things to all men. Okay? And so some like me, some hate me. Okay? But my, my job is to love God, love people, not to be a jerk doing it, you know, give glory to God's name, and to be confident and comfortable the way God's developing his character in me, right? Knowing I'm not perfect, but I want to stay humble, stay meek, stay gentle, okay? Sometimes I'm good at that, sometimes I fail at that, okay? But, it, but it's the heart of a man. We were talking about we stopped for a little bite to eat, and we're, it, you know, and Dan brought it up so well that that it's the, the heart of the matter is the heart. God's after the heart. At the end of the day, He's after my heart. Okay, what's all, what has to do with character development? Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me pray for you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for our time together. We just bless your holy name. We thank you, Lord God, that you're God. There is no other. We thank you that you lead us and guide us into all truth, the person of Jesus. We just ask, Lord God, that we be more and more open to be conformed into your image, that we wouldn't resist 
your guiding and leading, your development in our life of that which is holy and pure. That we would be lovers of your word, the Logos, the written word, but also the Rhema word. That we would be those that would desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit daily, refreshing us. Lord, seeing value in waiting without the buzz, waiting without the fireworks. We would see the value of sitting at your feet instead of just doing in your name. We praise you and thank you for your definition of these things, for your experience, the life of Christ, experienced, received. Help us in the art of receiving. Lord, we praise you and thank you. Bless this church and ministry. Bless the leadership. Continue to add to their ranks, Lord, those that truly will be made disciples of the living God, Jesus Christ. Praise you to thank you, Lord God, that we choose to walk tonight in humility and meekness and gentleness and, Lord, most of all, love. Praise you and thank you for your word. You're high and lifted up, Lord. We glorify your name. Thank you for our families, our marriages, our businesses. We pray that the city we live prosper, that we also may prosper to give glory to your name, to have means to help others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you real good. Thanks for having me.